Ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to the historic Pierhead building here in Cardiff Bay. It is a real honour to have been asked to host this event by Sam Blacksland and the Welsh Governance Centre, and I'm delighted to see so many here. So many familiar faces and so many who have co contributed to the story of the Conservative Party here in Wales. However, when I was first asked to host this book launch, which focuses on the history of the Conservatives in Wales between 1945 and 1997, I was sceptical to what appeal such a topic would have to those outside of members of our Conservative Party. But having purchased Sam's book and started the journey of reading it, along with mingling with you attendees here this evening, the story of the party in Wales is an incredibly important part of the wider story of Wales's political landscape, especially post-Second World War, and that is catnip to academics and politicians alike. But for those of you who have, may not have lent our way during that time, with roughly a third of the vote share throughout that period, the reports of our demise were great, greatly exaggerated. The Pierhead Building is a great analogy for how some people have viewed the Welsh Conservatives in the past. The Pierhead is part of the Welsh parliamentary estate, but is seen as slightly detached from it. The same has been said about the Welsh Conservatives being part of the political history of Wales, but not always considered central to it. It is these views that the Sam Blacksland looks to challenge in his book this evening through everything that he's contributed in the uh, history of the Conservative Party in Wales, 1945 to 1997. Unlike some in this room, I was not brought up in an overtly political household with party politics discussed even less so. But I consider myself quite clearly and unashamedly a Welsh Conservative rather than just a Conservative in Wales. I believe there is a more nuanced approach to our conservatism, where, for example, we are proud to be both Welsh and British, and that not being a contradiction. This is possible thanks to the work of many of the people that are featured too in this book. Sam and I were brought up in the beautiful county of Pembrokeshire, more than 100 miles to the west of our nation's capital a county that has provided its fair share of Secretary States for Wales in its time too. And let's not forget that it was a UK Conservative government that created the first Minister for Welsh Affairs. From Nicholas Edwards for eight years between 1979 and 1987 through to Stephen Crabbe and Simon Hart in more recent years, all three very different Conservatives from very different backgrounds, but all leaving their mark on our nation's history as Conservative politicians. And here, in Cardiff Bay, in the Senedd Cymru, the Welsh Parliament, we see the Welsh Conservative Party, the second largest party, ploughing a steady path of opposition to the often cosy consensus that Labour and Plaid have seemed to have reached. But how the party has changed here in Wales since 1997, I'm sure, is something that Sam may possibly look at in a future publication. <laughs> My party, our party, as we're about to find out, may not always shout the loudest about its achievements here in Wales. But that is not to say that achievements don't exist. The first Minister for Welsh Affairs, as I mentioned earlier, the creation of Espedwarek and the making of the Welsh language a compulsory subject in schools should all be things that we are proud to have delivered as a Conservative party. And never one to shy away from a poor metaphor and a sporting one at that, I liken being a Welsh Conservative politician to that of a rugby player wearing the Welsh jersey, or as a unionist party, the jersey of the British Lions. Much like a player donning those famous jerseys, they are only ever borrowing it, never owning it. It is bigger than them, existed before them, and will exist after them. Being a Welsh Conservative for me is much the same. We are custodians of the jersey, of the party, and for me, it's about leaving it in a better position and in a better condition than when we found it. But also, quite like the Welsh rugby side, especially of late, I would like nothing more than to put our streak of coming second behind us and finally win here in Wales. So, comfortable with the knowledge that I am not the Sam that you've all come here to see or hear from this evening, I'm now delighted to welcome to the stage the author of the Conservative Party in Wales, 1945 to 
Well, um, thank you, thank you, Sam, uh, and thank you so much to everybody for coming here today. Some people are here from very far away. Uh, my parents-in-law from Australia, um, friends from North Wales, friends from London. Some people have even come all the way from Poncana. <laughs> and thank you so much to the two Richards, Martin and Wynne Jones who showed a moving level of enthusiasm about hosting this uh, event from the moment I suggested it, and who helped secure this beautiful venue for us today. And thanks to Sam Kurtz uh, for sponsoring this event. Anything that has a disproportionate number of Pembrokeshire boys on the bill can't be too bad, in my view. When I launched my first book in the summer of 2020, I did so on my own, in my bedroom, speaking to a blank screen, uh, so forgive me if I milk this situation uh, a little. I'm going to do so because I don't suspect I'm going to have this kind of opportunity again, to be surrounded by many people who mean a great deal to me, with many new faces too, whilst launching something that has taken a lot of effort and is also rather personal. I want to milk it as well because I am proud of this book. I've had an indulgently long time to think about it and to write about it. As many people here know, it's a quite heavily reworked version of my PhD thesis. And I've had the kind of time that modern day academics don't have, frankly, um, have the luxury of, to read deeply, rethink ideas, let those ideas gestate, and to produce what I think is a good book and one that we need. Whenever I've told people that I'm writing a book on the Conservatives in Wales, I, I tend to get one of two responses. In fact, if I'd had a pound for every time I'd heard one of those responses, I'd be earning more than I'll get from the royalties on, on this. Um, one, uh, the first one is something along the lines of, well, that's going to be a very short book, isn't it? Um, I mean, it's pretty, it's pretty substantial. Um, and as I'll talk uh, with Felicity uh, about in a second, I think there is plenty to say, obviously. But the second comment I often get is some sort of variation on the theme of how long have I been a conservative for? And why did I want to write some kind of puff piece for the party? I do think it's worth scrutinising my motives in this regard, because I think they're important, and it does come up so often. Now, I'm certainly a small C Conservative in many respects, but I'm most definitely not a big C one. In fact, I think the two things are drifting uh, further apart from one another as, as the days go on. Of course, it wouldn't matter if I was a member or an activist of the party. Um, some very good historians are or were. And I don't blame people for thinking uh, that, uh, that I am. Uh, in demeanour and accent, I accept that I fit some sort of image of a Welsh Tory, uh, but looks can be deceiving. No, my motive for writing this, which I didn't know Sam was going was to say, but, it, but it's true, my, writing, my motive for writing this was more personal. I knew there was a historiographical gap when it came to this topic, but I also saw in the writings of Welsh history less time devoted to the places that I knew and felt rooted in. It's my deep sense of belonging to my home county of Pembrokeshire, but also our family holidays to parts of North Wales when I was a child, and my attachment to Cardiff, all historically conservative hotspots, that really ignited my interest in studying the politics of these places, of so-called British Wales. I think what's resulted is a fair picture of the party, one that gives it credit where it's due, but also the criticism it deserves, whilst all the while scratching the surface and examining people and places we just don't hear about in works of British and Welsh history. And ultimately, if we want a diverse, multi-layered history of any country, we have to look at various elements of it. And I thought I was the right person to do that in this context, by adding something substantial to our political and indeed our social history, for this is a history both of the Conservative Party, but also of the people and places that were most connected to it. The book has been a labour of love. Um, it draws upon a really quite huge amount of archival work, including lots of material from the party's archive in the Bodleian uh, Library in Oxford, but also from records in the amazing National Library of Wales, and a dozen or so other smaller local record offices. It draws from uh, lots of historical newspaper work and also utilises a 60-person strong oral history project that I conducted um, when I was doing the initial stages of the research, many of the participants in which are now sadly dead, like Geoffrey Howe, Peter Temple Morris, and some who are still with us, like Michael's Hesseltine and Howard. The book starts right at the end of the Second World War and finishes with the disaster for the Tories of 1997. In between, it asks how the party mediated its big ideas in Wales, often to tough audiences, how it designed specific policy for the nation, 
um, which has a pretty productive record on. You know, this is the, like, like we said, this is the first minister for Welsh Affairs on the, on the screen here, on the front cover of the book, um, a Tory. It also asks who the party's candidates were and what its grassroots were like. There are some big characters in the book, and if I uh, am allowed to say this, I think some of the bits that focus on those characters are actually quite funny. Not many people who, uh, know, for example, that the England cricket captain, Ted Dexter, um, fought the seat that we're actually in now, Cardiff South East, for the Conservative Party in 1964, turning the campaign into a farce worthy of one of my favourite authors, P.G. Woodhouse. Because I've been toiling away uh, at this for so long, I have, as I say in the preface, a long list of people who uh, I wish to thank, without whom this work simply wouldn't be as good. I must be one of the few children who went to a um, slightly intimidating West Wales comprehensive in the, uh, in the 2000s, the 2000s, and was told by one teacher that I was actually too polite. Um, but I'll wear that as a badge of honour and just run through, I hope, some people I'd like to mention and say thank you to. I've mostly singled out um, uh, people who are in the room today, but there's a much, long, much longer list in the, uh, in the book. And these people have very much helped me, um, as someone who isn't the most creative or original thinker in the world, to shape the direction of this work by offering just the right kinds of hints and the right kinds of insights at the moments when it mattered. This, this whole journey started really when I was an undergraduate here in Cardiff at the university, but it really got going when I went to do a PhD at Swansea, uh, Swansea University, where the Arts and Humanities Research Council funded me for what felt like a lot of money at the time to basically enjoy myself in archives and libraries for three years. Without that funding, I couldn't have started the project, but I also couldn't have done the PhD without Martin Johns, who was not only a wonderful supervisor, but someone who I later realised was a bit of a cheerleader while I was at Swansea and has since been a source of great advice ever since. He's not here, but Geraint Thomas, the, not the cyclist, the historian in, uh, in Cambridge, um, he, he peer-reviewed uh, the original manuscript and uh, was, was quite brutal with it, uh, to the point where there were some tears of anguish uh, from, from me. So I had to rewrite the whole thing, but it's so much better as a result. So if, if Geraint were here, he'd be getting a, a very big thanks. Uh, my pal, David Jeffrey, uh, proofread a first version. He made the lovely map that's on page four, uh, and he's talked uh, to me about this project many, for too many times. So thank you for that. Um, the late Chris Williams, uh, who, weeks before he died, made some fundamental suggestions on the proof of this book, uh, made it lots better too. And I'm so sorry to hear of his untimely passing, and I'm also sad that I never thanked him for the help that he gave. Uh, David Melding, who um, has not only given me a sense of what the world of Welsh Conservatism is like, but who's been a key intellectual force in thinking about this topic from within, kick-started many of my ideas right at the beginning of the research, and has since talked to me about those ideas and my interpretation of them. So thank you. Finally, um, this is so indulgent, but I'm just going to carry on doing it. Um, uh, I, I'm always surrounded by friends and family who I don't always deserve and who make life enormously fulfilling. Uh, and that, in turn, for me anyway, makes writing possible. Besides those I've already mentioned, my friends Fiona James, uh, my friend Andy, my brother Tom, uh, deserve particular thanks in this regard. Above all, Maxim, my partner, who's been here through all of this right from the beginning, keeps our entire show on the road and has supported me from stage one to do what I do. Finally, my parents, Sue and Stuart, deserve this book to be dedicated to them. Without them, it wouldn't be here. Partly because I wouldn't be here, I guess, in, <laughs> in theory. But they've given direct and indirect support of all kinds that, have, uh, that has made life easy, comfortable, happy, which again is a very useful frame of mind to have when you're writing a book. So, thank you all for coming today. Um, Fliss has very kindly agreed to have a chat with me about this now. But afterwards, please hang around uh, for a drink. Please hang around for a chat, uh, even a trip to the pub. Uh, that's where I'm certainly going uh, afterwards. Think the Eli Jenkins uh, over the road. If you bought a copy of this, uh, I hope you like it. I hope you want to talk about it. I hope you want to uh, critique it, uh, use it in your teaching, whatever. And considering for how long I've been saying that it's forthcoming, which has been for a very long time, I hope you think it was worth the wait. <laughs> Thank you. Sam, thanks very much for that and for filling us in on, on the background to the book. We'll get into the substance of it now. The idea is that Sam and I will chat for half an hour or so and then we'll throw uh, the floor open to you guys. So if you have any questions, then uh, do store them up because you will get a chance to ask them in about half an hour or so. Well, Sam, let's pick up on something that you mentioned there in your introduction, which is what a neglected area of research the role of the Conservative Party in Wales has been. Why do you think that is, and what has been the 
impact of that neglect on our sense of the political pluralism of Wales, if you like? I mean, it's, it has been neglected. It's not been totally ignored. And, I, and I've been rightly um, pulled up in the past for saying that it's been ignored because other people have talked about this. There are, there, are, there are academic articles out there. There are other scholars who have focused on this. There's been PhDs written on it. But there's been nothing of book-length version in the same way that we've got about Labour, the same way we've got about the Liberals, the same way we've got about Ply Cymru, obviously. Um, there's, even a, there's even a book that came out before mine on the Communist Party in, in Wales. So... It, there clearly was this gap that needed to be filled, to use that kind of hackneyed, hackneyed phrase. I think the reason why we haven't had it yet is partly because there is an element of the politics and the history of Labour and Plaid Cymru being more exciting. Um, you know, Labour Party history is about class conflict, it is about struggle, it is about some really key moments. Labour has totally dominated in Wales. In the last 100 years, Wales has been Labour country, and that is, that is legitimately then reflected in what we, what we read. Plaid Cymru is a is a unique party to this nation. So I, I see why the focus and the attention has been elsewhere. But I think there is also a, there is an element of we write the kind of history that we do want to, uh, to, to sort of reflect and, and we want to write history that we are interested in. And it's not unreasonable to say that a lot of kind of history writing in Wales has come from the left and has been very amazing scholars. You know, people like Kenneth O'Morgan, people like Gwyneth, Gwyneth Williams, John Davis, people who to some extent, weren't, I don't think, interested in the Tory party because they weren't of it as well. Um, so my, my view has always been that all of that is great and all of that is fine, and these people have done fantastic work, but there was something missing. And like I said a minute ago, I think if you want to do a proper, diverse, multifaceted history of any nation, it needs something like this. And the Tories have been, the Tories have been more successful in Wales than we would often imagine them to be. You often hear... You hear sometimes quite key BBC, not BBC people in Wales, but sometimes kind of national BBC figures. And they'll just throw out something like, oh, the main parties in Wales, Labour and Plaid Cymru. And, they, and it's, it's these assumptions that the Tories don't really have a presence or have never had a presence. I mean, Sam was saying, you know, what was I saying? Probably nothing very um, interesting. Basically, um, uh, well, before we were so rudely interrupted, oh, sorry, yes, we sorry, yes, about yes, the... Opposition in the Senate. Yes, exactly. But also, um, you know, historically, typically, the second party. And when, when you've got a two-party system, when it's just Labour and, and, and the Tories in the 50s and the 60s, that's not news. But when you get a multi-party system and they still remain the second party, that's kind of interesting. And the vote share in Wales always hovers at about 30%. It's, it's, it, well, it doesn't, it's not always there, but it's about 30% through all these general elections in the post-war period. And that's not great. And it's far worse than in England. And it's, far, it's not great for a natural party of government that wants to be in office to only, get, only getting 30%. But 30% is substantial. And that vote is coming from particular areas, like I said, that I don't think we hear very much about. Yes. And in that respect... Let's reflect for a moment on the balsam model of, of Wales mm. then. Uh, you know, and, you know, of Rogham Rig, you have uh, Welsh Wales and you have British Wales. In terms of the, the areas of Wales that you're referring to, the sort of common understanding would be that for the Conservatives, read British Wales, mm -hmm. right? To, to what extent do you... It's a simplified theory, yeah. of course there are exceptions to it, but to, to what extent do you buy into that and sort of use it as part of the lens to understand the role of the party in Wales? Well, I very much use the three Wales model in the book throughout because it is just a... It is, to some extent, a neat way of oversimplifying, <laughs> oversimplifying things. But when you look at the... 2019 general election results and obviously first past the post judging things by constituencies it's not straightforward but the, that election looks almost identical to the three Wales model, the Tories are winning in the British Wales seats now of course as Richard's written about um, it's very easy to, to miss the point here in, to some extent, you can, have, you can be a staunch conservative in, in Plaid Cymru heartlands, you can be a Plaid Cymru uh, supporter in, in Monmouthshire, you know, all this kind of stuff so it, it misses those subtleties but actually it's, an, it's a not unuseful way of, it's a shorthand for saying look the places in which Tories are more deeply rooted are in these kind of British Wales areas which are the border constituencies with, with, um, with England where I'm from um, and, that's, and that, is, that, that, is, that is useful, that is useful and to what extent, then, is it easy to sort of associate the party with more anglicised areas yeah. of Wales and, in a sense, miss on, I suppose, one of the central tenets of your book, which is the extent to which the Conservative Party in Wales has... are the architects, really, of modern Wales, mm. even of, mm. of the, de the devolution yeah. period. So the first Minister for Welsh Affairs in 1951, mm. uh, Maxwell Fife there on, on, on your front cover, is a Conservative... Mm construct. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit about that. How has the party shaped 
modern Wales politics. Yeah. Oh, it's interesting, the first point about like anglicised areas and you know, the stereotype would be English people vote for the Conservative Party, and, and that's not untrue, of course. I mean, there is, a, there is a modicum of truth in that. When you look at the, when you break down the Conservative vote and you look at kind of ward by ward areas, the places that have very uh, high levels of kind of English immigration on the North Wales coast, for example, seem to be disproportionately Tory and all that kind of stuff. There is, there is an element of, of truth in all of this, but of course, it's not the full story, and you can be a proud, uh, born and raised Welshman and be a, and be a Conservative. And this is where it all gets a little bit... This is where, for me, it gets interesting, because when you talk about this topic, people want to know. They want to hear about, well, what did the Tories do for Wales? And my answer is, I think, quite a lot. You know, the, the Minister for Welsh Affairs is... It's not a kind of major, significant role. He's also the Home Secretary at the same time. Um, so it's, like, it's a slight kind of, like... Not a sop, that's the wrong word, but it's, 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 it's a kind of concession in some ways to Wales. But they are the first people to do it when Labour are actually being very resistant to the idea, because the Attlee government is very kind of centralising and all, all this kind of stuff. But then, as you move on, you know, in the 1970s, when Peter Thomas is the Secretary of State, um, he's, he's quite in favour of bilingualism, so you get, this, you get that kind of push there. And it is the Thatcher government in the 1980s that really make big strides in this area, massively increasing the funding for things like bilingual literature. Um, the uh, the, the ICEDVA gets a much bigger block grant for underneath the, um, the Conservative government. And all of that doesn't kind of necessarily ring true for some people because these, you know, the Nicholas Edwardses, who was the Secretary of State at the time, is very plummy-voiced, kind of Westminster-educated, merchant banker from London. But they think, they articulate all of this by saying, well, it is a, a naturally conservative thing to do to preserve an ancient language, for example. And I think it is really important because the reforms that happened towards the end of the 1980s in terms of broadcasting and the language... Um, what it means is that you don't suddenly create this completely bilingual nation. That doesn't happen. We can talk about whether that's, a, that, that, that's been broadly a failure. But what you do is you give people like me, and I say this all the time, but I think it is really important, you give people like me who's grown up in the most anglicised area, in the school that probably wouldn't have taught Welsh kind of before this time. Suddenly, right from the get-go in your primary school years and then into your secondary school years, you have to learn Welsh. And even if you're you, you, like me, you, you, can't, you can't speak it properly, you have a sense then of being different. You have a sense that there is this different culture and there is this different tradition and there is this kind of historical rootedness. And that has a massive... I can definitely see within my generation of people, most of whom can't speak Welsh where I'm from, have a, I think have a greater sense of being Welsh and being, and being different just because we use that incidental language every day in school. And that's, a, and that's something that the Tories did, and I think it is really significant. It's been a bit of a clumsy dance, though, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. in the sense that... Um, there is, a, there has been a tension to navigate and continues to be a tension to navigate for the party between the emphasis on Britishness and yeah. the emphasis on Welshness. To what extent, wh how severe were those sorts of debates around the time that, that these various steps and decisions were made? Were we seeing a you know, a, a lot of angst within the party mm. at the Welshification of, of, of some of these measures. Loads at, at all levels, you know, at the very top as well. I mean, the, uh, Sam mentioned S. Pederek, S. Phil C. I mean, that was, that was in the Conservative Manifesto in, in 1979, but then they kind of reneged on that, and they only, they only actually created a separate television channel under quite a lot of pressure. Mm. So it was, it, it, it is a clumsy dance, and it is sometimes awkward, and you've got a lot of people saying, well... You've got a lot of kind of middle-ranking people in the party, often backroom types, saying the more we push this Welsh agenda, and they were saying this kind of in the 60s and the 70s, the more we push this, the more we're going to actually delegitimise our position as the unionists and as the kind of the British party, because if we keep emphasising Welshness, then we're going to be the other that, they don't quite phrase it like this, but it's exactly what they mean, we're going to be the other who is the most un-Welsh, and I think you see, that, you see that now, that is something that is very, very clear, that people think... Conservatisms, conservatives, conservatives are English. Yes, I mean, and you took the words out of my mouth there, because I was, I was about to, to, to ask you that. I mean, your book goes up to 97, of mm. course, up, up to the, the, which is the devolution referendum, so it stops before the, the devolution era, but we are in a situation now where many would argue that actually, to, if, if the Conservatives have helped to shape modern Wales and the devolved Wales that we now live in, they have done so at their own expense, because they have made themselves the other yeah. to the parties which, it's especially Labour, which has so successfully Welshified itself and used that brand very cleverly for electoral success. Yeah, well, precisely. And they are between a rock and a hard place. Because if, if I were 
offering some advice, which I'm not, and I'm glad I don't have to, then what would I say? I, I mean, if you want to be more liberal and really push the Welsh agenda, then who, who might vote for you? Because they've got other parties who are on that sort of more liberal wing of politics anyway. If you want to be more robustly conservative and emphasise the kind of British element, then you're going to alienate other people too. So I think, I actually think the Conservatives with their kind of, their ceiling of, you know, 30 something percent of the vote is probably, is probably a ceiling that they're not going to be able to crash through. I just don't see any, any way forward for them. I mean, there's, there's obviously no way forward for them at the, at the moment because look what's, look what's coming. But, you know, in the kind of, the medium and, <laughs> sorry to all those people in the room who, uh, who, are, who are, who are, who might still be hopeful, you know, but, um, but you know, in the kind of medium and long term, I, I personally think, and I say this right at the end of the, the book, I think there is a space in Wales for a, for a, right, a robustly right-wing political yeah. movement that, that could actually be quite nationalist, but it can't be the Conservative Party who do that. And we'll come on to that, but in terms of the people who populate your book then and the people who were having these debates and were making these decisions, one of the, my favourite things about the book, actually, is the space that you give to grassroots members uh, to share their experiences. You know, this isn't just about grand men in wood panelled offices, is it? So no, it's about grand men in the in sort of local yeah, conservative yeah. clubs, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So tell us who who were these people? Mm. Who were these ordinary conservative grassroots members yeah. who were also, you know, living and working in Welsh society? Mm. To what extent did they see themselves as Welsh versus British, did they even sort of have that binary in their heads? What did you learn? Well, I mean, I, I was, I'm glad you say you like this, because I was worried that this was one of the, the more boring bits of, of the book, but, I, but I, I had to do it, because when you go to the archives, when you, particularly when you go to the Bodleian in Oxford, these people are there, they're screaming at you, they, 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 they're talking to you, because they're just in all these reports that the party officials are sending back to central office saying, there's this troublesome person as the you know, association chair in Pembrokeshire who's causing me problems for all these reasons. And you can just imagine this really kind of interesting, eccentric character. And they often are eccentric. Because I've tried to make a, dif a, a distinction between people who are just paid up members. And there were thousands and thousands and thousands of them in some constituencies in like the 50s and the 60s. We're talking like, I think something like ridiculous, like 12,000 members in Barry alone. You know, that's like very substantial numbers of people who are paying to be a member of the party. Now, of course, that doesn't translate then to people who were running associations, were knocking on doors, were being activists. You have a tiny proportion of, of the actual membership who do that. And of course, as can sometimes be the way with politics, the people who are the more prominent are often the more eccentric and interesting. But they, what I tried to do in the book is to say that they're often woven into not just the Conservative Party, but to the wider kind of fabric of civic society, which is kind of Welsh and British at the same time. It's often, you know, the army, or it's the, or it's the girl guides, or it's the, um, the neighbourhood watch. It's, it's, it's Solidly kind of, middle class. Oh, it's very, it, is, it is very middle class. At the, at, the, at the membership level, you do get kind of clearly working class people, because you get a lot of complaints that they can't afford the relatively small membership fees. But the people who are running the show at the grassroots are almost exclusively middle class, sometimes very posh. You know, there's some absolutely brilliant things I found about like real kind of old military men whose honorifics kind of like fill the whole top of the first uh, the top of the letter header page and all this kind of stuff um, and yes very anglicized and often business people often industrialists often kind of um, middle or upper management in kind of industry or manufacturing and all this kind of stuff so but but they but they're not always just conservatives they are um they, they, kind of, they kind of are woven into other areas as well. And there's lots of women, too. So for the vast majority of the period that I cover, m women completely outnumber men in terms of, num in terms of numbers at the grassroots. Now, they, they're not always in leadership figures, in leadership um, positions, but sometimes they are. And you can tell that these are really kind of gutsy, brave sometimes women who are just going out and campaigning on their own and making stump speeches off the cuff and everything. And, and, and it does kind of, yeah, it makes you... It makes me a little bit kind of wistful and, uh, and think, oh, that, I, I quite like that idea of pavement politics and, and, and speeches on the corner of streets and things that clearly was happening in like the 50s, for example. And what about the candidates hmm. then? Because if we hark back to the three Wales model and the, you know, the steady 30%, as you say, not an insubstantial uh, proportion of the vote, but not enough, hmm. and the failure really of the party, despite Despite that relatively solid base to properly break through, mm. ultimately it's a story of failure, isn't it? Because that's what political parties are for at the yeah. end of the day. Yeah. 
Um, where, where does that failure lie? Was, was it in not having the candidates that they could field in Welsh-speaking areas or working-class areas? I think, I think to some extent, yes. I mean, you can't lay all the blame on local campaigns necessarily, but I, do, I, am, I am one of these people who believes that the local dynamics in a seat can shift the dial a little bit. Not fully, but, but, uh, but enough sometimes, especially when there's these big town hall meetings and you get to see who your, your potential representatives are. Are. And I, I did a lot of, I sat there in my little office in Swansea for months and months and months doing quite a lot of data crunching. There's a fantastic book that gives you all the biographical details of all the people who've ever stood as parliamentary candidates in Wales. So I extracted from that age, schooling, language ability, where they were born, where they lived, all this kind of stuff, and tried to just get some, get some data out of this. And what you see is that um, in kind of more working class areas, it's, they very rarely field working class candidates, although they do occasionally, and they're very interesting people when they do field them, but they're conspicuous by their absence. And in, in Avrogan Rai, in, in Welsh-speaking Wales, um, in, you know, if you've got four or five seats that are kind of that encom encompassed by that area, at most general elections, one, maybe two Welsh speakers in those areas, and you've got voters and the local association alike saying, this isn't good enough. You know, this is, this, the language is integral to the politics of this area. We, we do our pustings you know, in Welsh sometimes. And the Tory candidate who's a, who's a doctor from Cardiff or you know, a solicitor from London can't speak much, and that's kind of that's a pretty fundamental failure. Yeah. In in places, by the way, you know, it's a lot of the I do think that a lot of those biggish rural seats in North West Wales would probably be conservative if they were in England. You know, large rural, touristy sometimes. I mean, well, there's a lot of sort of post-industrial labour mm. heartlands that you could say the same about if, yeah. they, if they were in England. Oh yeah, I mean, like I mean, North East Wales, you know, did have some constituencies that went. Conservative in the last general election, but yes. it certainly did not happen in the South Wales Valleys. Why did none of the South Wales Valleys come anywhere close to going Tory in 2019? Because they're in Wales. Yeah, in, and in terms of that, you talked about the research and the data crunching that you were doing, but you also, as you mentioned there in your introduction, did a really interesting oral history as well, didn't you? With a, about 60 odd mm. interviews. How what was that like? Why did you? It's terrifying. <laughs> why did you decide to take that approach? And you know, in terms of the research methods for for history, it's not necessarily something that um, all of your colleagues will, would have done. Why? Mm. Why did you decide to go down that avenue? What did you get out of it? Do you? Think? I think the, the greatest thing about doing contemporary history is you can interrogate your subjects, uh, and that's a really nice thing. And they often won't give you what you want or give you what you need, or they might <laughs> avoid things. And memory... Welcome to my world, I tell uh, you, every time I do yeah. an interview. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and obviously, me even if they're trying to be helpful, um, and I know some people who contributed to that project here, and I'm, I'm genuinely I'm very grateful, and I used a lot of the, 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 the material. But memory is fallible as well, so you have to treat it all with a very big pinch of salt to compare it with the documentary evidence, the newspaper evidence as well. Um, but it was a... It was a it was a hell of an experience because I was when I started this project. I was, what I've been, twenty-one, and I was going on a semi-regular basis to the House of Lords to speak to all these people, like in their nineteen eight. The first person I ever spoke to was Nicholas Edwards. He was Lord Crickhowell by this point, and he was getting quite. He was getting on, and he'd been the MP for my constituency well before I was. I was born, and it was the most intimidating experience I've almost ever had. He just, he just looked down his glasses at me for the entire time and just sort of stared at me. And he was very polite and he gave me a copy of his book and he bought me tea and all this kind of stuff, but I didn't think I really get, got very much out of it. And there was one, um, I've told some people this story, but there was one um, very senior Welsh Conservative, I won't name because it's, it, it's cruel, but people could probably work it out, who I was, I was interviewing and I asked him this very long, kind of quite leading question, probably quite a bad technique, and he suddenly just... <laughs> And I, and I, I I'm, I'm not joking, I thought I killed him. <laughs> I thought, I've bored, I've bored him to death. I've bored this very, and I'm talking very senior. Didn't ever sit for a Welsh seat, but you know, someone who was Welsh and was conservative, who'd been very prominent in the 1980s. Uh, uh, <laughs> just down like this. I was, I was about 10 seconds, like, and then suddenly, he sort of came up and said, oh, sorry. And I said, right, fine, fine, that's all, that's all we need, that's all we need to do. So I, I didn't get a huge amount from it, but what I, what I say in the book is that even though the oral evidence isn't quoted that often, doing that project gave me a very big sense of what Welsh Tories were like. You know, you go and speak to 60 people, you get a bit of a sense of what this world is about, and that, that's one of the ways it was really useful. But oral history is... is, is um, 
it, it can be disparaged by people, and I understand why. I do loads of it. It's what, what my day job is. I still think it's a very slippery method, um, but I still like doing it. And I guess you combine it with the data too and all that sort of thing and you get a fuller, you get a fuller picture and you get the colour of being afraid that you've killed your interviewees, which, you know, I suppose I was terrible. I was gives you an added jeopardy, doesn't it? That you do. uh, let's go back to your comments about the space that there is within Welsh politics for a, a right-wing party, a centre-right party. You know, we've seen, for example, the result of the Brexit referendum, evidencing that, you know, that, that there is an appetite... Mm -hmm there um why is it that the conservatives haven't been able to adopt that mantle and could they ever be that party or does it need to be a, a different party I, I think it just does have to be a different party and i think i mean it, it is important to bring brexit up. I, I thought maybe we wouldn't i i i do think ultimately brexit was broadly a conservative small c conservative project it was about immigration it was about kind of the, the concerns that people who lean rightwards have. And there is, I'm convinced about this, there is a there is a big streak of social conservatism that goes through Wales that doesn't map onto party political lines. And the EU referendum demonstrated that to a large extent. But I just think that, and, and this is work that's been done by the Wales Governance Centre, you know, and, I, and I've drawn a lot from that, there is still this almost unmovable kind of idea that the Tories are just not compatible with Welsh politics. And they can't shift the dial. Uh, on that. I mean, there are some people who don't care about that. For, for some people, it doesn't matter at all. You know, people don't consume purely Welsh media. They consume the British media, and they, don't, and they think about their politics more in a British sense, and they don't, they're happy to vote for the Conservatives, even if they think of themselves as, as Welsh. But for a lot of people, there is still that resistance. And in, you know, in, in, in the South Wales Valleys, for example, what was so interesting is that well into the 40s, 50s, even the 60s, you get some of the old stalwart Labour MPs there um, referencing the 1930s referencing the depression you know and calling it a tory kind of a tory mistake or, or something something engineered by the tories and just as that's starting to fizzle away you get the minor strike and you then get that our communities and our way of life has been decimated again by the conservatives and some of that i think is valid some of that is is, is legitimate the, the the winding down of heavy industry in that way in the 80s was not a particularly conservative thing to do i think um and that's a it's a legitimate critique of the party that they just can't get over because it just is, it's partly practical politics that has been done badly, but it's also a sense of incompatibility with those areas. I mean, it begs the question then, what is the future for the party? Perennial opposition, you're suggesting, yeah. in Wales. And I, and I say in the book that maybe that's the best they can hope for, because if you, if, you, if you are the significant opposition in Wales, but you use that as a platform, as a base to talk about your ideas and talk honestly about what you believe, then... Is that better than, well, the, the, the alternatives? Although I, I guess all of this is slightly um, uh, fancy talk, really, because things are looking pretty bleak now for the month, isn't it? So. Well, certainly, you know, you look at the polling at a UK mm. level, but, yeah. you know, these, the pendulum swings, yeah. doesn't it, eventually? It'll swing quite far, yeah. I'd imagine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, indeed. So, um, so for, for a lot of Conservatives reading your book and listening to you, it's a fairly bleak conclusion that you that you come to, isn't it? I, when I reread, when I first got my hands on the copy, I reread the epilogue, because there is an epilogue at the end that talks about the post-devolution context and says you can't understand the post-devolution years without understanding this period of history. And I reread it, I thought, this is quite good, actually. I, I'm not like, I'm, I'm not one to blow my own trumpet, but I, this is, I think this is a good summary of how um, things are where they are for the party. And like I say, I don't see how they escape the bind that they're in, like I said a moment ago, between the, the rock and the hard place, which is that whichever way you go, whether you sort of, I don't really like the talk of a political spectrum and left and right, incidentally, but if you go kind of leftwards and kind of into more liberal territory, you alienate some of your natural supporters. They've always been very um, critical of the, the Welsh language and, and, uh, and, and all sorts of liberal causes. But if you go rightwards and become sort of more... More, more robust, I guess, in your conservatism than you alienate other people. And it's just a, it's, I wouldn't know what to suggest. And in terms of party members specifically, are they further on that right-wing spectrum? Yes. <laughs> so in terms of selection of party leaders and that sort of thing, mm. to try to elect someone who is perhaps more attractive to the middle ground, which, generally speaking, it tends to be where elections are fought and won, 
that's arguably a problem too. And there's, there's fewer members as well, so decisions are being made on things like leadership candidates by fewer people. I know there's some of them in the room, but it's now a... Yeah, it's a... It, you, you, you can end up with strange outcomes like Liz Truss, because someone who was absolutely, very clearly unsuitable to be Prime Minister, so obviously, just somehow wooed um, slightly eccentric people in the grassroots membership, and I think that's the way that it's... That, that is probably the way... The, 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 the next Tory leader will be, I would imagine, someone who... We've been talked, we talked about this before, but someone who's, who voted against or who abstained against the smoking ban, for example, someone who is resisting some of that kind of that, that drift towards I don't know what it would be, how people see it, more state control, more 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 nanny statism, um, and whether that then has a broader appeal to the wider public, I don't know. Maybe it will. Well. There are a lot of questions to be answered, I suppose, before the, the, the battle for the soul of the party really commences. There's a, there's a general election to be had, isn't there? This is a good time, I think, to bring you guys in and um, to get your questions. We've got them. If you come round to the front, Richard, we've got, um, we've got our first questioner. Thank you. Hello. Thank you, Sam. Um, it's nice to see a, a Liverpool Conservative MP on the cover of your... Um, as well as someone who prosecuted Nazis, but, you know, most importantly, Liverpool Conservative MP. Um, my question is about... And, and a really, really sort of big gay rights activist. So. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, it's all right. Um, so my question is about this shift in local government elections where, where now councils can choose whether to use First Past the Post mm. or STV, mm. that they wish. And we saw in places, say, like in, in Scotland, in Glasgow, which returned a Conservative councillor on like 8% of the vote, mm. that you can get in these very traditionally hostile places, small Conservative bases and hubs upon which you can hang an association. And what might it mean for this three Wales model where, you know, you've got these areas where the Conservatives never go. Mm. Actually, the local voting system is mm. much fairer to local preferences than first past the post. Yeah, well, sure, it would make it, as it would in Liverpool, I suppose, it would make it more, um, more interesting, more diverse, and you would get sort of smaller, interesting parties coming through, maybe kind of local pressure groups, local interest groups. Um, yeah, and that would, that would certainly disrupt what the three well, what the, what kind of the pattern looked like in terms of the three wells model. Um, I quite like first past the post. I'm, I'm, unf I'm, um, I'm old fashioned in that sense, I think. Uh, First past the post in things like general elections uh, or or senate elections produces uh, well it was senate elections for, long, for general elections I think it broadly gets the right kind of results so I'm, I'm I, I like that but you're right it would it would certainly make it more easy it would make it more interesting for people like us who study these kind of things and uh, for cephalogists if you had a more uh, intricate voting system but uh, I mean do, do you think would it would would it happen here I don't know. <laughs> I mean, you, uh, I mean, you, it, this is your area of expertise. Next question, then. Um, and you won't always get a supplementary fired back at you, I promise, so don't be put off. Well, well, oh, gentleman there. The mic's just coming to you now, sir. Uh, my eye lit on Gwilym Lloyd George as I opened your book and his move to the Tories from the Liberal Party. A lot of flack this week about the MP for Dover mm. and um, what's happened in the Labour Party, and they're not terribly happy. Are there any parallels with how Gwilym Lloyd George was received by the Conservatives when he crossed the floor? Well, he was a, to begin with, he was a national Liberal, which was slightly different actually from being a, a, a Liberal in that sense. And when he was the MP for Pembrokeshire, he used to, he used to go to meetings that were kind of co-chaired by both associations. So it would be the, the, the national Liberal chairman and the Tory chairman would take turns to kind of chair all these meetings. So it was a very natural drift towards conservatism for, for Gwilym Lloyd George in, in particular. Um, the parallels with um, thingy Elphical, I suppose, are, are not quite uh, 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 that easy to draw because, I mean, why, why she did that, I just don't know. It doesn't make any sense to me at all. But Oh, very happy to, yeah, very happy to welcome him because he kind of was there already. So I, I do this in the book in either chapter one or, or two. I sort of talk about how there is this big national liberal faction in Wales. So there are actually at the grassroots lots of informal and formal pacts between the Tories and the national liberals where they stand aside 
for one another and sort of lend their support to each other. Because by this point, by 1945, the National Liberals are basically seen as kind of soft Tories anyway. So, and that is what Gwilym Lloyd George is, which is so interesting, because obviously his father, being who his father was, but also then his sister, um, becomes a Labour MP, Labour MP for Carmarthen from 1957. Um, so it's all, um, yeah, what an interesting sort of family dynamic thing going on there. I mean, David Lloyd George wrote that he always knew that was going to happen between them. He always knew that Meghan was going to drift leftwards and, and Gwilym go to the right. Thank you. Anyone else? Right, right at the back there, Richard. I don't know if you can... Richard's putting the miles in. Well done. <laughs> Thanks for this. Uh, Sam knows who I am already, so uh, I'm Reggie Buffett, yet, but I will soon. Uh, just question. You said that the Conservative Party is not right-wing-ish to win or be a leadership uh, party in Wales. So would you say another party, if it was formed in Wales, would uh, be able to take over the Conservatives? And what kind of policies would that right-wing party hold in order to attract the voters? Mm. I mean, luckily, I don't have to be in a position to advocate for these, for these kind of things. By the way, it's very nice. When, when your former students come to your book launch, it's very nice to, uh, to see them. So thank, thank you. I taught this man in... Um, years ago now in Swansea. Um, I mean, the, the, with, with this sort of stuff, I mean, I didn't say that the Conservatives have to be more right-wing. I said that if they, if they were, certain things might happen, and if they, if they were less right-wing, then other things would, would happen. What, what are some of the key policies? I mean, there are, I think there are just a lot of things in British political life that we just don't have a kind of, um, just a frank conversation about that the political class, as it were, like, are actually on a, in, a, in a different place and on, on a different page to quite a lot of people in the general public, be that on, I'm not saying what my views on all of this are, but whether that's kind of on um, immigration, on environmental policy, on, on aspects of, of, of the economy, on the NHS in particular as well, even I would go that far on schools and things like discipline in schools. And I think a, a, a sort of, so, I, I always say this kind of, uh, a party that was quite socially democratic in terms of its economics, in terms of, um, I don't think people care about slashing tax and going all kind of neoliberal on, on us when it comes to, comes to tax, but a party that sort of was sort of socially democratic but much more culturally and socially conservative would have a purchase with a big group of people who don't feel like they're represented at the moment. I think something that was akin to kind of post-war Labour, the kind of the Ernie Bevins of this world, obviously readapted for the modern age, would would be popular, but there's not many people talking about that kind of, you know, kind of patriotic, however you define that, but broadly socially conservative. I think there is a place and a role for that kind of politics that we don't really have now. Thank you. Anyone else? Alad, at the front, right, right at the front. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, congratulations on the book, Sam. Well done. Um, I just wanted to ask you to... Um, just talk a bit about Wynn Roberts. Mm. Yes, thank you. Because, yeah. um, I mean, a lot of people would say he was one of the most underestimated politicians. Mm. But I think, um, I think I'm right in, in saying possibly he was the, the minister who held office for longest. Yeah, 14 years, yeah. Certainly the Conservative Party. Mm. Uh, could you talk about, a bit about him and his contribution. Yeah, thank you. I'm so pleased you've asked that because he is probably, in the period I'm covering, probably the most important and influential kind of Welsh Conservative and someone who was a genuine Welsh Conservative too, you know, born in Anglesey, um, I mean, he went to Harrow School, but you know, he was kind of a, he, but he was a kind of, he was a, on, on a scholarship, no, that's very true, yeah, no, actually David, that is, that, that is true, it's very important to distinguish between scholarship boys like that, but he was a, he was a, he was a kind of staunch Welsh man, and you're right, he was in, he was in that role from 79, he was Minister of State in the Welsh office, although the title changed, 79 to 94, I think, so that's 15 years. The big question, of course, is why he was never made Secretary of State, and I used to ask people this all the time, and they'd never quite give me a straight answer, and I always felt that there was something going on, I mean, I got, I interpreted it, you know, as, as, as you would as to why that never happened, but he is the, he was what in, in the Welsh office, they used to call him the, the Minister for S4C. Um, he was the one driving a lot of the Welsh language reforms um, and a very kind of practical guy at like, getting things through the House of Commons. So Nicholas Edwards was very much the, the, kind of the key political person, but Wynne Roberts was, one, I think, very practical in all of that sense too. And he could go to 
I step foot and, and speak Welsh and kind of be the kind of the, the kind of the, the, the Welsh representative. And he's really he's really crucial. He held on to his Conway seat um, from 1970 to 1997 when he stood down. So he's a he he is probably the fundamental kind of Welsh Welsh Tory. Um, he died a week before I got the funding to do my PhD. So I really wanted to kind of at least meet him and get a sense of what he was like and, and ask him lots of questions. But um, B.A. Dye, which is a shame, but he is, he, is, he is fundamental. He is kind of, he's not typical because he was Welsh speaking and he was kind of quite culturally Welsh and all that kind of stuff, but he is, he is super important. He's behind a lot of the, those reforms that I mentioned. Thank you. And good at working with other people as well. We were talking about um, how he was friends with David Ellis Thomas and kind of, he was, he was good at reaching out to other people. Thank you. I'm, I know in your book, um, it's been picked up by particularly Nation.com, where you talk about Enoch Powell in your book, and Crowley's quite an interesting figure. Everyone knows interesting figure on a lot of different things. Mm. But it's quite interesting to read about his influence on Wales, and I know in my own research, he's come up in other things of being quite an interesting character. In what, in what sort of way? So um, Enoch Powell was, believe it or not, legislatively quite an early leader on gay rights when it was going through Parliament, believe it or not. Um, so my question would be, what would you make about Enoch's pal view on Wales and his relationship to the Conservative Party in Wales? Yeah, I don't blame, I don't blame at all um, that article that reviewed the book bringing out this, because it is one of the more eye-catching elements of the book. I mean, it's only about two or three pages that, that cover it. I mean, Enoch Powell is not fundamentally central to the story of how the Conservatives in Wales um, develop, but he does do one significant and important thing, which is in 1948 to 49, he's sent on a tour of Wales to basically do like a fact-finding uh, mission, and he writes up two reports, one on urban Wales and one on rural Wales, and, and they're very detailed and they show his kind of very, they show his kind of um, sharpness of mind, because he obviously was an incredibly uh, impressive man in the sense. And in this report he makes loads of recommendations, but one of the things he recommends is that Wales should have its own ministerial representation. So he's the first person to say, no, this idea of a minister for Welsh affairs is a, is a good and right thing to do, and it will recognise the distinctiveness and the, the cultural kind of distinctiveness of the nation. So it is only one step from his recommendation of that to the Tories pledging in the Wales Charter in 1949, which sits alongside some of those really key documents of the post-war period, like the Industrial Charter. That's where they pledge the Minister for Welsh Affairs, and that's that kind of first devolutionary kind of um, moment in terms of governmental representation. So he's key in that he does something interesting and kind of thoughtfully writes it up and uses his skills in the Welsh language, which he did have. Um, but he's not like, he's not the maker of modern Wales. I was kind of tempted to say that once, to do a bit of headline grabbing. But he's important nonetheless, and it was just interesting to go into the archives. I knew it, the sort of the story anyway, but to go into the archives and actually see all these big files written by Powell about this, this, all, all this stuff. Really interesting guy, despite, you know, what people think of him and what happened later. Massively clever. Thank you very much, Sam. Thank you so much for all the questions. I think David is going to wrap up now, so I will not wrap up. I will allow David to wrap up. Please do. Thank you very, very much. And I, first thing, I congratulate Sam and uh, thank him for this evening and Felicity also. I think this... Uh, uh, in conversation style is uh, excellent. It uh, draws out some really, really interesting uh, uh, views. I, I, I feel somehow spiritually we, we should thank Di Bernardo oh, yeah. as well, who looks down on us. But he symbolizes the Conservative Party's misunderstanding in, in Wales in many ways, because his fife, of course, was not the banana's fife. That, that's completely different. But uh, of course, that was lost on the good people uh, in the 19. Uh, 50s. But um, I, I do think it is quite remarkable that we've waited so long for a scholarly appreciation of the Conservative Party's role. But I think you'll all agree with me that it was worth waiting. <laughs> At least we've got something of exceptional <laughs> quality. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I think, I can't remember when we first met Sam, but it... it, it 2014. 2014. And when people come and talk to you and uh, interview you and, you know, you, you have a general chat, uh, it, it always sort of crosses your mind if they're young. Um, you know, are they possibly interested in a political career and should I sort of, you know, attempt them? 
But I did see a putative academic, I have to say, in, in, in Sam, and I think you are following your, your vocation, so I, I think you were right to uh, uh, pursue uh, a, 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 an interest in politics, but uh, in academia. Um, and I'll say a little bit about academia uh, in a moment. But I, I think I ought to say that uh, th this wonderful approach to balance the analysis with a review of grassroots activity and what it was like to be a conservative is really, really important. And it does rem remind me of the work of John Ramsden, which I think you mentioned actually in the introduction, that the late John Ramsden, in my view, wrote the best history of the uh, UK Conservative Party. And you get this great richness, really, about uh, politics and what it's like to actually do it as well as just uh, study it, and it's really important. And so anyway, this is my excuse for a couple of uh, stories from my own, now long forgotten, thankfully, uh, 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 trail around uh, 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 various elections. But I started out in uh, one of those uh, great bastions of socialism, um, Blaina Gwent, the old Ebo Vale. And uh, Sam makes uh, quite a bit in, in his book of the, uh, how shall I politely put it, the ambivalence of some conservative clubs in the Valley's areas. And uh, I, I think Blaina Gwent had the highest proportion of conservative clubs of any South Wales constituency. Now, this does strike one as a little odd when you arrive there. But anyway, in the campaign, I, uh, I was well into it, and I thought, well, we haven't been up to Tredegar yet, and I know there's a con club in Tredegar, so the ideal thing would be go there and speak to the members. So I said to my agent, Bill Price, well, I think we should go up to Tredegar and go to the con club. Now, Bill was one of life's optimists. When canvassing, if on the doorstep you weren't actually physically assaulted, he would put the household down as at least possible as far as a conservative vote is concerned. But to my suggestion that we should go to the Tredegar Con Club, I felt a certain coldness. But I persisted, and eventually he took me to Tredegar Con Club, and we entered. And there was a reception committee immediately, the chairman, the president. So welcome, Mr. Meldin. And they took me into uh, a little ante room. And uh, well away from the main uh, bar where all the members were, and you could hear the hubbub and everything there. Then a pint of beer was offered. This is 92. It was, 90s was the last great drinking decade, I would say, but uh, in my experience. But uh, uh, a pint was offered. Then a second pint. Then a third pint. Remember, Bill was driving, not me. But at the third pint, uh, I, I said to the chairman, well, you know, your hospitality is marvellous, but I think I ought to go in now to the bar and meet your members. And he looked ashen, and he said to me, Mr. Melton, I can't allow you to speak to the members where you would be subjected to abuse and ridicule. <laughs> and I thought the crushing word there is not abuse, it's ridicule. <laughs> I, I completely ignored him. I went into the bar, and I was, uh, well, you know, received robustly, I think it has to be said, but with great friendliness. But if I had more than three votes there, I would have been very, very surprised. The other thing that chimed so much uh, when I was reading was the, uh, uh, the proclivity of, uh, of selecting very posh English candidates in some of the most intractable Labour Valley constituencies. The most notorious of these, I should say, I, my first job was working for the party in the 80s. The most notorious of these was Aberdeer. Now, in Aberdeer, they would start their uh, thoughts about the selection at attracting a member of the aristocracy. That was their opening pitch. And with great difficulty, they had to be persuaded, perhaps, to lower their sights, at least to the English higher gentry. And, uh, and then, you know, they would very proudly, uh, and with great hospitality, uh, blood 
this, uh, uh, this uh, 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 candidate. One of them, incidentally, was James Arbuthnot, who went on to have a very distinguished career and was very kind to the people of uh, the Aberdeer Association. Now, you're probably thinking it wasn't called Aberdeer in the 1980s, and you'd be quite uh, right. And in fact, when I, were, I, I eventually got selected for Blinder Gwent, but I actually did try to get selected in Cannon Valley first. So up I went, and uh, then we all, all the candidates met together and some sort of group work was done as well as individual interviews. So we were there uh, having coffee just before the formalities were going to start. And this one English uh, potential candidate came up to me and he said, um, could you advise me on uh, how do you pronounce the name of this constituency? <laughs> Now, believing in original sin and being subjected to its temptations, I thought, oh, I should just say Sinon Valley, shouldn't I? But uh, I did avoid the temptation, but I didn't get the selection, so I should have been brutal, perhaps. Um, what I think you know, is most distinguished in this work is the way it does cover the party's achievements, its motivations, which inevitably in life are so often mixed, its frustrations, and the challenges it has faced, some of which have been overcome, and should we politely say, some still remain today. But I do think it's a great use of material, the interviews, the archival work. I thought I was familiar with some of the archives, but crikey, I now see a master at work, and uh, I realize how little uh, I knew. And can I just say, um, I, uh, the Bodleian's wonderful, but we now have a great archive in the National Library for Wales. The Welsh Conservative Party has led the way here. We're the only party in uh, the devolved era to have uh, su uh, uh, submitted all our records uh, to the archive in the National Library of Wales. And I do hope the other political parties will follow suit because I'm sure Sam will uh, uh, will agree there's some very, very rich material which does need to be there for future uh, uh, scholars. But I suppose running through any appreciation, if that's what it is, of the uh, contribution of the Welsh Conservative Party is this question first posed by the party itself in 1968. Have we been anti-Welsh? That was the question they asked themselves. And as we've uh, heard, the party has certainly contributed to Welsh nation building in really innovative ways. But there has been also this gravitational pull of much of its core vote. And, you know, let's be frank, we've seen that played out. It's played out in the 1950s, which was a surprisingly innovative decade in, the term, in terms of the party's development in Wales. But we very much had it in... Uh, uh, or have had it very much in the era of devolution, even in the first 12 or 15 years when the party did a lot to help uh, build up the uh, strength of devolution and really made an effort to uh, 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 develop its Welsh dimension. And I do think that uh, the Senate, uh, which you know, in essence was inevitable that we would have a parliament once we had uh, that referendum uh, being accepted by the, uh, uh, the Conservative Liberal Coalition uh, and had then held in 2011 and was really a turning point, I think, in Welsh politics. And I think the party can proudly say it did its bit. We were neutral in the end, but that was as far as the leadership in the Senate could get the party. And I think it was really key that we were, uh, many of us, out campaigning for a full parliament with legislative powers. Um, but in terms of nation building, even when we look at the Welsh office in the 1980s, which I, I do think was developed into um, something near a state, I, think, I can't remember if it's your phrase, Sam, or whether you were quoting someone, but it's a very key way of putting it. <laughs> because the 1980s and the Welsh office is the nearest thing you've got to, yet to a conservative government in, in Wales. And it is curious that the party has struggled, perhaps, in the devolved era 
when we would have to win in Wales by winning in Wales and not uh, uh, relying on winning in Westminster, that, that we've not made that you know, an absolutely essential part of what we uh, were about as a political party that had a national role and a governmental role. And then I think what you mentioned in the, in the discussion, which is why this sort of discussion is so valuable, is the miners' strike rejuvenated much of the animosity that had uh, been lingering since the 1930s uh, and related to the depression of heavy industry then and then the running down of heavy industry in the 1980s. The mistake was not that you know, all the deep pits were closed. I don't think there's one in Western Europe now. Um, it happened everywhere. But if you look at the German experience, the Conservative government there you know, had a long program of transition away from that uh, and, and very active support in the communities. And I think that is probably where uh, the Conservative Party went wrong in government in the 1980s and uh, the consequences stay uh, with us. Uh, and then in your epilogue, you say, we're in the silver medal position and that's probably the best we can hope for. But as a party, I've always said, we don't belong to our members. Our members are key, the most important people out there in many ways. But a political party, if it's healthy, belongs to the nation it's in. And we really do need to go for gold. So I hope that message is taken back uh, uh, this evening. Um, but I, I must end by saying, although the story really uh, in this book concludes in 1997, we have a tantalizing epilogue, which is excellent. I agree with you. But I hope that is just the preface to the second volume of this history, which will take in the uh, devolved uh, uh, era. And can I thank the, uh, the, 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 the Wales Government Centre because uh, academia plays such an important role in politics. And I think it's fair to say that we didn't have a great start in, in, in the 2000s from the universities in terms of some of them anyway, in, in, in really looking at the evolution, what the, the powers were, what could be done, what literature was out there, what, you know, how should these powers be used more effectively? But with the Wales Government Centre, uh, which has now been going for, I don't know, is it 12, 15 years? You know, it's just been an absolute sea change. And some of the, the, the quality of the work is just utterly exceptional. And I think this evening's event is a real demonstration. And I do hope that continues. But anyway, final thanks to you all. I think we've had a super evening. and. Uh, uh, we, we now have uh, another book entering the Welsh political canon, and I really do congratulate you, Sam, on that. Thank you.